play. Hello, uh, we are actually uh, meeting today with Mario and I think this will be like a weekly occurrence, at least for the clay season, I think also for the grass, uh, which, where yeah, we're just going to meet and talk about what's happened uh, in ATP tennis, uh, Nick is covering WTA and uh, yeah, as this is our first time, uh, Mario, how would you like to proceed about this? You know, what's maybe what's what excited you the most uh, this week about ATP tennis? Uh, you know, uh, we, we just started the play season. We've got, we had three uh, pretty cool events. Uh, what was, you know, the, the thing that got you going? Yeah, that was quite something. Obviously, I didn't remember how exactly this show, these shows started, but apparently it was that. So yeah, Mario, what got you going in this week's tennis a year later after the first episode of the ATP Weekly? Yeah, I mean, uh, as you know, as I always say, I, I find pretty funny when we have, you know, uh, different events uh, this week, three different events actually three different continents in Africa, in the United States, in Europe, in Portugal. And yeah, I guess we can also, um, we can start the, to talk about what's happened in Portugal since you, you also were there. And yeah, it's been, it's been a fun week. I don't know if a lot of people were expecting maybe Urkac to get this first clay title. I mean, not a big shock considering he's the second seed and after especially you know after Rude defeated Martinez um, that have been very good you know very good signs um, he hasn't got you know um, so many big wins but in terms of you know ranking and, and I would say that he very good signs considering you know how he's Play season can go maybe you know it's a week that also assures us a little bit that he's in with the right mindset in the right form and maybe he should avoid yeah then it will depend on the draws and all this stuff but a very good week for him yeah yeah boy on the screen there uh we did visit Astoril this week with John and uh, we, I hope you enjoyed all the content on the channel, guys. Uh, of course, I kind of wanted to say that we were putting it out. It was pretty much John. I had the easy job, you know, just standing there and asking questions or sitting there and asking questions, depending if it was a mixed zone interview or press conferences. But anyway, uh, it was definitely quite a lot of fun for both of us. Here you can also see both me and John. Uh, so And also Basel, who's appeared on the show before. I don't think Gop Gokalp did, but maybe in the future. Um, all of us really enjoying our time at one of the matches. John with a beer, <laughs> Basel with uh, croissants, Portuguese croissants. I actually, I'm not sure which they, you know, what in what sort of way they differ from French croissants. But anyway, uh, regardless of croissants and the uh, eating at the venue and the drinking at the venue, yeah, it was a very fun time, obviously. And yeah, let's talk about Hubert Furkac. Uh, obviously, the eleventh, I think, active player who breaks, uh, who who gets a title at all <laughs> three surfaces, and uh, basically, uh, this was maybe kind of unexpected. But if you think about it, if you look at what he's been playing on clay the last few years, 
2020, I think he still appeared in Kids Biho at around, uh, of course, the summer. And then after that, 2021, 2022, he only plays Monte Carlo, Rome, Madrid, Ron Garros. 2023, he has Estori loses to Zapata Mirales in round two. But like literally over the past four years, besides the four biggest clay events, he's only played Estori twice. So I think um, after, especially after this week, it just kind of feels like, you know, he has the quality to do this, at least occasionally. It's just that he's not playing the smaller clay events, nor that he should, I think. Because especially now that Madrid and Rome are the two are the two week masters and stuff, there will be a lot of players going for a similar sort of scheduling. I mean, he clearly doesn't want to play a week before a slam. I think he's kind of tried that a few times in his career. Obviously, Winston Salem, he won his first title like this, or for example, the Canberra Challenger before the Australian Open, and then 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 got kind of burned at the slam because of that. So I think he's not going to try that. And uh, yeah, I mean, on his weakest surface, to me, it's perfectly fine that he's only really playing the biggest stuff. And uh, apparently, Estoril, the last couple of years, starting uh, his uh, clay swing there. And yeah, he was actually pretty impressive, despite the opposition, as you said, not being that strong. Only one top 100 player faced. But I think especially as the court uh, sped up during the week, uh, it got sunnier, the weather got better. It really suited his game well. He was also like really hitting through the forehand pretty good. Like I um, kind of think that the higher bounce of clay uh, is a little more comfortable even to him sometimes than uh, some of the more natural surfaces for him, um, especially considering the huge serve, which of course is still a factor here against someone like Garin, for example. Like it just feels like he forces these, all these clay court specialists to be super clean on their serves. And they're not used to that, you know, they're used to that fluctuation. They're used to that, all of that, like up and down momentum. And, you know, it doesn't matter that you lose serve against Hurkacz. It actually does matter. And yeah, he, he did play a very sort of sound final as well, despite maybe Martinez being a little tired, um, was able to be consistent when he needed to be, was able to blast the serve and forehand when he needed to. And uh, all in all, sure, I, mean, I don't think it's that surprising, but it's cool for him to have this achievement sort of in the bag and, yeah, just have a title each on all three surfaces. Yeah, absolutely, for, for that reason. And also it's, uh, you know, a title this year. Um, so, you know, Sunshine Double was not unforgettable for him, even if, you know, especially Miami lost to, to Dimitrov, it's more, it's okay. Um, but yeah, I would say that it's it's a very fine way to to start the clay season. I I, I guess every you know everyone would have loved to to start um, their clay season with with a title in the bag. And so yeah, I would say that also for a player like him, you were mentioning the four, and I yeah I agree um, was 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 hit at a high level um, throughout this week, and it's actually important on clay even more maybe. For for him because you know clay is usually a surface where you need also to 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 get this power with with your forehand you cannot really you know um, use the opponent's the opponent's shot speed and so yeah I, I feel like he he got this ability to move very well for his height and so he's showing that also on clay and it's superbly fine but you know having the ability to to hit with the forehand a bit more, doing it at at a high level can really help him also to to shorten the points, to mix things, to get some you know more winners or uh, going to the net sometimes to close the point, with, which is really you know good at it. But at the same time, he he has also I mean that solidity, especially back and side as always, and yeah, moving defending, let's say well. So yeah. I would say that maybe it's surprising because we think about Urkacz, big serves, you know, uh, the, the court speed. But yeah, I um, on clay he did pretty well um, at at times in the past. 2021 had a bad patch, but 2022, for example, has also been in the second week at the French Open. So he's been able to win, you know, some matches on the clay. So doesn't really, you know, shock me. So, yeah. yeah. It's a pretty funky title that we have for this episode because I would say the most surprising, we have Shelton and Hurkacz surprise, and I would actually say the most surprising champion was Berrettini, but of course we'll get there. Yeah, well, definitely, it definitely wasn't Shelton, let's say that. Uh, but anyway, yeah, also Nurlan, as, as usual, saying that the conditions don't matter. 
I really don't know, Nurlan, where you get that belief from. Have you ever played on clay and on faster surface? I don't know. Uh, but anyway, and um, yeah, with a story as well, uh, where do you think this puts Hurkacz sort of in the next clay events? Of course, he's not only going to play the big four, if, you, if I may call them like this, again. Um, do you think this like significantly improves his chances to go far in these events? Or do you just expect sort of a regular Hubert Hurkacz clay season with that small difference being the, well, not that small, but like with the difference being the Estoril title? Yeah, we were we were wondering also that while you know we were doing the live commentary of that final. It's it's a big it's a bit difficult to to really predict. Uh, I guess it will also depend a lot on the draws. You know, maybe if the draw opens up a little bit, he he can have his chances. I don't really think actually he he it, it really does change that much. Still, I I would expect. Let's say solid clay season. I I don't know if he will be able to to have a, a big peak on this surface this year, but yeah, for sure. The um, I mean, having played uh, four matches on the clay, having won them all, getting the title, your confidence gets higher. So I would say that he, in my opinion, he is that player. Where let's see also what happens. I mean, also with the draws, as I said and all this stuff but i don't really think this changes too much in my opinion in terms of you know the power ranking for the the clay big events mm, still positive signs but i i don't know if it really changes that much mm, my perspective you know i totally agree uh that was kind of I, I have to admit that my question kind of had a thesis in it like i was expecting a certain answer i was hoping to get a certain answer and you delivered it <laughs> because that's <laughs> that that's what i believe as well i don't think it really changes much but yeah just uh, you talked about his 2022 season so just to, for example to tell you guys that in 2022 Hurkacz went 9-4 on clay which was actually pretty mm -hmm. awesome i mean quarters monte carlo quarters madrid one round one loss in Rome, and then fourth round at the French. Like, that's really good. That's something he could really, you know, go for and, like, really believe that this was a very good clay swing. Last year, he went five and five, and it was kind of, like, up and down. I mean, obviously, he had a match point against Sinner in Monte Carlo. That was the highlight, probably. But then there were all these three, five setters at the French. There was that second round loss to Wolf at, in Rome, which was kind of shocking on clay. Mm. And um, yeah, I mean, I think if 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 these are his results in 2024, he will be disappointed. Of course, post the story I'm talking. But if if it's more towards 2022, that would be a very good outcome already. So yeah, I also don't think it changes all that much, but a little bit probably. Um, I don't know if we're gonna be talking about Dom Tommy Paul Ghosty. Is there really <laughs> no. any reason to talk about Tommy Paul? <laughs> probably no, not. I don't think so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think it's a joke towards me or, you know, he, me and him got uh, just a few talk on, on some live commentaries here and there. <laughs> Indeed, he, he said this in Italian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I only understood Buongiorno Ragazzi and then the last sentence, the second one is actually a total mystery to me, but I could understand, you know, more or less what he wants. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Um, Pedro Martinez, let's talk about him. By the way, did we finally, I don't know, I have to ask our producer, but our producer is out now. Did we finally set um, sort of the Jakub Bobro player of the week? I, yes. And it's going to be Martinez? Martinez. Okay. So okay. our Jakub Bobro player of the week in the memory of our late friend is going to be Pedro Martinez, who made the final in Estoril. Of course, he was already in the top 100. He is already like a you know, career high 40 player. However, we figured that uh, he was still sort of like the well, Berrettini wouldn't quite make sense as a you know under the radar player, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. Martinez maybe not as much as well. But that win over Root really changes everything. He was zero and six against the top ten. Uh, interestingly, zero and five on hard, zero and zero one on clay. Only had one uh, top ten match on clay against uh, you know, only one had one top ten match on clay. But that win over Root that was something special. Maybe there were some signs pointing to it, you know, throughout the week and especially after that quarterfinal of Gasquet, which, okay, I know Gasquet, 37 year old and stuff, but I was watching that match and I remember talking to someone, I don't think it was John, but it was someone else in the crowd. And I was just like, am I really? Oh, I know this was Tom, the, the French journalist who was also there. And I was like, 
is this really Pedro Martinez? I mean, I, I don't know what I'm watching. I mean, the guy's just going after every shot. And against Kasper Ruth, he just took it to a completely new level. I will definitely remember how um, basically every single, um, sort of basically at the mix zone interview of him after he beat Gasquet, Martinez says that, you know, Kasper has such a big forehand, I'll have to be aware of it. I'll have to, be, I'll have to take care. And then in the semifinal, it was Pedro Martinez who had all the big weapons. You know, How can I, we, you know, Ghosty, this is actually, so, sorry, Mario, one more thing. Ghosty, this yeah. is a rule. Uh, we cannot give this to Hurkacz. This has to be like a lesser known player. That's the rule of the Jakub Boblo player, Boblo player of the week. And uh, yes, uh, Mario, now. Yeah, no, I was, um, you know, I've always been, um, been thinking that Martinez has in him, you know, um, being a bit more aggressive at times, trying to to go for it a bit more, and I'm happy that he he did it. He's maybe was also you know uh, up on confidence this week. He's been playing well lately, and yeah, this week has been pretty amazing. You know, getting this 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 wins at, at the beginning of the week, and then that semi final over three hour first top ten win. Actually, Rude is doing very consistently this year. So. Um, you know, many many of us were probably just expecting him more or less to cruise his way uh, through through the draw, at least you know to to the final against against Turkac. But yeah, Martinez has had other plans. Mm, played a, an amazing semi final. Mm, the level was pretty pretty high for him. Rude went you know um, a little bit ups and downs throughout the match, but Martinez uh, was you know really really good and yeah it's actually curious that he he had played five times on hard against against top 10 and only once on clay because you would expect him maybe if he has to get a chance maybe on clay it's more likely to to play against the top player for example like it happened in this tournament um but yeah very very good good week and let's see how he keeps going because we know that some players uh, also when they when they feel particularly confident that maybe can be a little bit of kind of a dark horse it mean that maybe they can get one upset along the way let's see if he will be able to do to do it again i don't know but because um, you know just talking about this week it's been very very good for him and you know, especially after last last season, was pretty pretty tough. Even if you know he got a couple of, of good runs in the end, but starting 2024 in this way, really you know, is really going to help him. And usually, also this clay opportunity in a 250 like Estoril, you know, a tournament where he he can get one chance. You know, if he if he plays very high level, mm, yeah, very very good good thing for him. So let's see how he keeps going. Yeah, I mean, to me, that was the best match of his career against Kasper. Um, you just kept sort of waiting for Ruth to maybe break him out of that insane streak of confidence that he was on. And it never happened, even when things started going all right at uh, 5-1. And, you know, there were a lot of match point saves, drama, and you actually started believing that Kasper might come back. Martinez kept his foot on the gas pedal. There was really amazing uh, as you said late in the year he started getting some form actually i was i was already impressed like with how you know he sort of solidified his position as a top 100 player again one could say maybe saved his career even in the past six months but mm. then yeah i mean here he shows potential that um i don't think he ever really produced ever earlier and um yeah, I mean, it's a shame that maybe in the final he wasn't able to give the same sort of intensity. Yeah. Actually, after the first three games, I said to Basel, with whom I was watching this, that um, it's going to be 6-3, 6-4. And I don't want to take any credit for that. It was just kind of the feeling that, well, Martinez does not have the energy to go today yeah. again. So uh, so that was pretty much it. But um, as I said earlier, I mean, Hurkacz still played a very sound match. And I've actually, I think he actually recognized it pretty quickly as well and sort of um, tactically was just making sure to play very aggressively on serve, but then on return also just be very consistent, not go for too much, and um, eventually exploit that physical um, difference between them. When John asked about it at the press conference, Hurkacz gave a non-answer, which was actually a bit of a theme of the week. 
that Hurkacz was going to give a null answer to most questions. <laughs> However, um, I think he actually did see that Pedro was a little down today physically mm. and uh, today, sorry, not today, yesterday. Yesterday, okay. And um, and managed to uh, exploit that for sure. But yeah, all in all, uh, of course, still a great week for Martinez. I think his third challenger final. One of them he actually played against Casper Ruth, interestingly. Let's also talk about Casper Ruth, actually. I think we'll be sort of closing off a story soon. Um, maybe also one more question at the end I'll have for you. But also let's talk about Casper Ruth because I kind of, uh, on Twitter, I put out this tweet where I said that, you know, he impressed me both as a person and as a player. So I feel like I kind of have to explain myself, I suppose. <laughs> and uh, this was actually a thought that I first formulated in a 3 a.m. talk with John. I don't know if he remembers that even, but um, he sort of asked me, who impressed you? Like, did, did Ruth impress you this week? Oh, that's what he said. And I said, yeah, as a person, as a player. And then I figured I should also tweet this out. Because, yeah, in interviews, he was super open, insightful. You really you know, sort of felt like you're talking to a person, which um, I don't want to say that there were many players like this this week, but of course that can happen. And um, he was just really, really easy to sort of just... Um, throw something at and then he goes on a tangent and just kind of tells you everything about his game and his mental state which is really good obviously uh, really easy for a journalist but more more importantly as a player uh, I really started believing in Casper Root more after this week and um, I know that I've said some stuff in the past regarding his Grand Slam finals regarding his no, 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 well, yeah, sure. lack of big titles but, but it, it wasn't wrong you know it wasn't wrong but this year Mm, something is maybe lacking in terms of result, meaning that he hasn't won a title, uh, lost a couple of finals. But I I also think that there's something mm, a bit different in, in, in his game. You know, he lost this semifinal. Okay, I don't want to really change my mind because of, of this result, even because, you know, he is a top 10 player. His results will be judged at, at the end of the clay season. Um, especially because he's not lacking, you know, 250s in, in his in his cabinet, of course. Uh, but yeah, I, I feel like, uh, as he also said uh, in the interviews, he's trying to to do something more with his forehand, which he can. And I felt that in 2022, when he started getting bigger results on on hardcourt, regardless of the draws and all this stuff, he was. Mm, you know, hitting his back end better. And last year, mm, I don't know, he didn't really mm, follow followed up uh, to, to that, in my opinion. Um, yeah, played too passive in a lot of moments. And right now he feels like more, you know, I, I may lose this match, but I, I want to... Mm, I want to do it also, you know, playing my cards and do, you know, just firing my shots. And it hasn't always happened. For example, against Jari in Miami, was uh, was not really doing it. But overall, he's you know you can feel that he's trying to um, to evolve as a player. So yeah, I would say that I I would like him to to have big results on on these you know events that that are coming up on the clay. If he doesn't, probably I will be a bit disappointed. Mm, I think yes. Yeah, I, I kind of like his chances at like, I don't know, final at a thousand now or something like that. I don't know if a title, I mean, we'll see. Obviously there aren't, you know, these ty- these events aren't just going to be like every week. But but yeah, I mean, I, I don't think the semifinal loss matters all that much. Maybe we'll come back to this if there's like more players who just peak on the day and beat Casper throughout the clay season. Because obviously Martinez, yeah, as I said, I think that was the best match of his career. But um, yeah, I mean, that was um, especially for me because um, the last time I saw Rude Live was in 2018. And I'm not saying mm-hmm. that was really shaping my opinion of him as a player anymore, because obviously it's, it's been a lot of years also in that match he was injured with his, with his right shoulder against Artem Smirnov in uh, Gdynia. But uh, what I'm trying to say is that right now, like he really oozed quality, you know? The, the stroke production, just the average shot that he plays, obviously the forehand especially, uh, he was like, he was class, you know, you could feel that he's a star of this event, like you could feel that he's the best player there, I don't care that he didn't win it in the end, uh, mm-hmm. he was pretty scary still, and I, I do actually like sort of that, um, yeah, it, it really changed my perspective on him in that I think now that he has more room to grow than I previously thought. Uh, I thought that Casper as a player has kind of maxed out. 
And um, well, maybe he has sort of, you know, making three slam finals, maybe that was still a little much in such a short amount of time, at least. However, in terms of just keeping up the progress and growing as a player, I think, yeah, there's still, there's still something to gain there. There's still something to uh, sort of uh, look forward to. And um, one more question, Mario, for you. Are you on the Estoril hype train? Are you on yeah. the yes. campaign? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I want it in the calendar <laughs> next year. Yeah, I, I like the event. Um, you know, I, I, I've i never been there, so you for sure. I, I read that you you wrote on Twitter that you, you had a very good experience. And so, you know, I, I've also uh, been happy to read it because that's my feeling at home. You know, my feeling is that it's a good event, enjoyable to go to 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 watch the match. It's a good venue. I I I feel it's you know also good crowd. It yes, it has all what it takes to be a good tournament in my opinion. So I really would like it to to stay in the calendar because I feel like it's a very good good place to to be for for the tour. Let's let's hope for the best. I I would like it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, it has everything: the picturesque location, uh, the uh, sort of um, the the organization is really high level. As Ghosty said, it, it has great facilities. Also, like a lot of uh, attention is paid to the players or even the journalists, mm -hmm. like being comfortable there, having a good time. And um, yeah, I mean, what I said here, I definitely, uh, I definitely agree with it. Uh, I, I feel like there was still like a lot more player contact compared to the previous uh, main tour events I was at, which sometimes felt like, I mean, yeah, there's one press conference a day you can attend. Otherwise, you can basically just see watch the matches, which you know you can also do at home. And obviously, yeah. it's better to watch them at the stadium. But like, is it really worth it to have like all this press room there and stuff? Whereas in Astoria, I actually felt useful, <laughs> and I guess that's yeah. that's kind of the big change compared to the other main. Yeah, like, you know, it's three to fifties. But my feeling is that on Astoria, there's always a little bit more of attention because usually, for example, this year there were a couple of top ten players. I mean, if if it if it's it's not in the on the calendar next year, of course it's going to change. But my feeling was this year and even in the last few seasons that Testorilla has always been a tournament where there was um, quite a good attention also for being at 250s. But let's see. Yeah, I met lots of people as well. Uh, John, of course, I already knew, but um, you know, it's not like we're meeting every week, but also all these people like Basel, Gokalp, uh, there's a Polish journalist we, I, I met as well, and um, a lot of the Portuguese tennis Twitter uh, sort of carousel with Gaspar, Steve, Jose and stuff. I mean, yeah, definitely that's uh, that's also one of the highlights of this week. And absolutely, I would love it if it stayed on the calendar. From what I understood, it's probably going to, like they are very optimistic that it's going to stay. One of the ideas is that it's going to be in the second in the week before the French, but they kind of mm. don't want to go for it because there's Hamburg ATP 500. Yeah. Barcelona Munich would be like their their destination, but the ATP doesn't want a 250 in that week with the two 500s. They might they might also stay in the same slot on the calendar because apparently Bucharest might move. Tiriak doesn't want the event in Bucharest, but someplace else. Tiriak doesn't want that date, but the ATP just wanted to like you know release the calendar, so they like kind of put a provisional schedule there. Yeah, we'll see. But um, yeah, John says seventy-five. I feel like most of the people I talked to said about ninety. <laughs> uh, seventy-five might be more realistic, but uh, they are still hopeful. They are still optimistic. Apparently, that tournament director, or whoever has like a lot of connections as well. I feel like, you know, the effort should be made for the event to stay. Mm -hmm. We'll see yeah. when, but if it does, uh, there's a very high chance that me and John will be there next year as well. Let's just say that. Also, Portugal seems seems having a good generation right oh, now. Right. It helps of players too. also. So it's also, um, it would also be bad for, for the country also for Portuguese tennis, which I feel is in quite a good place right now. So... Yeah, the producer is right. We should mention Joao, so, so, Joao. because he he wasn't mentioned too much. He wasn't mentioned that much this week, you know. No, it was like every single day. Joao Souza had a um, had a, a sort of retirement ceremony there. But to be honest, like watching, you know, his farewell and stuff, 
I, I wouldn't say I cried, but I did get like a little water in my eyes. I have mm -hmm. to say, it was pretty beautiful. I I was never like a big Joao Souza fan or anything. He was like just kind of you know a random player on the tour for me. But I did did enjoy sort of also you know myself being able to tell him, congrats on a great career, man. When he was leaving the the press room or whatever, and I I did you know sort of enjoy being part of the moment even if it wasn't you know something that was that big for me as you know individually but yeah he got a great send-off obviously but as you're right that like if a story was going to go forwards Nuno Borges obviously will be a, a big part of it every year but also we've got Enrique Rocha you've got Jaime Faria uh, in doubles Francisco Cabral who would also bring the attention bring mm -hmm. the emotions for the Portuguese crowd every single year so uh, it's not like on Joao Sosa, the, Sosa, the biggest, the best player, Portuguese player ever. We just end the whole thing. No, there's actually people coming after him. There's people who are already there, like Nuno or Cabral. And uh, yeah, it would be great also for them and for the for Portuguese tennis if this event stayed. We've dedicated so much time to Estoril. We're going yeah, to have yeah, to like, yeah. speed it Meanwhile, up. I've been to the Challenger Tour this this week, this last week, because I, well, I, I've been a lot of times in, in Barletta. Which is uh -huh. very very close to my to my home. It's like twenty minutes by car. So oh, wow. yeah, I, re I really enjoyed. I I always go there. So I'm pretty. I, and I always remember that Nadal won the event. Oh <laughs> it really? Was his first Challenger title in two thousand and three. <laughs> So, um, so Rafa won uh, won uh, his first Challenger event. Yeah, like exactly. Twenty minutes, Marleta. twenty minutes drive won from the you. Title also. Two years no, but later, like he, he he won your, he won his first challenger twenty minutes drive from you, and he won his first first ATP tour title like twenty minutes drive from me actually. So, yeah, <laughs> uh, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, but, exactly. um Yeah, also won also won fees, who you see on the screen. He also won uh, in Sopot in two thousand five, I think. Rafa in four, right? Uh, uh, or the other way around. Anyway, doesn't matter. We're gonna have to speed it up a little bit for Houston yeah. and Marrakesh, but there's still a lot, a lot of interesting stuff to talk about. We also try to give like five minutes to Monte Carlo, but we'll see how we're gonna stand with time. Uh, we have about 33 minutes right now. Anyway, let's maybe talk about Marrakesh then. Of course, an Italian won the title, a very well-known one, Matteo Berrettini, but just his third event of 2024. How insane was that? And I think especially considering that Marrakesh kind of ended up being like. Estoril, but without Rude and Hurkacz, or maybe even mm. a little worse than that, it didn't have the high seeds, so it kind of felt like a, you know anyone can take it type of event. And yeah. Berrettini just said no. Yeah, absolutely. And I've been I've been quite impressed, also actually. Um, I would say especially the semi final because uh, the semi final against Navone started, you know, was really. Um, it was really tough. He he did he produced a lot of effort to to try to stay in the set, but still dropped it in the tie break, and and then I was like, okay, this is a, this is a test for him because you know third event of the year. I know that Miami was humidity, the conditions were different, but you know against Mare, a very physical match, he wasn't you know superbly ready for it, despite him not being very well, and I was. Mm, let's see how it does here because mm, Navone also played played well, uh, high level week, and you know at that point it seemed like difficult. And Berettini was mm, just you know in increased his level as the match progressed, and he did the same against Carbayes Baena. Um, again, tough first set here. Uh, you know in the final even better because he managed to win it. Was love for it down when he was serving for the set at six five. And you know, managed to win five straight points, take the set, and then the second just cruised. And yeah, I would say that um, he he had to pass some, you know, a few a few good tests um, throughout the whole week, and he did it, you know, very successfully. Uh, so especially considering his situation, it's a very very big deal. And yeah so welcome back to him to to the winner cycles and then we will we will see we will watch him also in this this clay big events i don't know if he's ready to get you know um a lot of good wins uh very big wins you know mm, but clay is actually a surface he finds himself very comfortable playing and playing on um as more or less every every surface but you know um, I feel like he he has that 
that solid level you know he's always been able to to gain his level right after being back by by injuries mm. Let's see if he's going to stay healthy, you know, with him. It's always more or less that's the main question uh, right now and in the last couple of seasons. So let's see how he's going to do physically. Uh, but hopefully he will stay, you know, pain-free and just without injuries. And I think that he's going to, of course, raise raise the ranking because it's not this position, the one that, you know, portrays his his level. Yeah, um, four titles on clay, four on grass now. No titles on hard courts, but I think the natural surfaces specialist argument dies very quickly. If you yeah. think about the fact that it's final at both. yeah, <laughs> both hard court slams is what I was going for. Yeah, absolutely. This is the this is the big one that sort of just tells you, nah. I mean, he's just good everywhere. It's just kind of a matter of coincidence, I suppose. Only one hard court final against Lorenzo Musetti, of course, in Naples. Uh, but yeah, uh, as you said, the Navone match, also Munar, uh, just players who would really test Berrettini's mm. rally tolerance, consistency, and he managed to pull that off. I mean, even the final against the defending champ, Roberto Carbaez Baena, the first set lasted like an hour or something like that. And uh, he also manages to get through that. So obviously it's a big ranking jump for him back inside the top 100. Uh, but yeah, I mean, getting all that playtime in Phoenix earlier, just sort of fighting through a lot of these matches, seems like it was also kind of crucial. And then even though he lost in the opening round in Miami, he's able to kickstart his clay season in a fantastic manner here. Of course, we're going to have to wait and see how he follows that up. But for now, yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic result for him. And uh, certainly I was not expecting that there was going to be one player this week who was going to like, I can't really say dominate Marrakesh, but like was going to be confidently the best player in the field. Yeah, exactly. And he was. He absolutely was. And um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we should probably mention Carpaez Baena as well. He was trying to defend his title. We actually had a pretty funny one as well this week because everyone was trying to defend their titles. So we had yeah. Kasper Rut in the story for a while looked like the main favorite. And then Carpaez Baena and Tiafo who made the finals. But actually in the end, no one did. Um, I mm -hmm. remember talking to this one guy uh, during the week, you know, um, who basically said that if they all defend the titles, he's going to have to, like, try to look it up, you know, if it ever happened. And then in the end, no one did, yeah. even though I was sort of sitting there like, I know, yeah, Rude is certain. Tiafo mm, has a very good chance. Carbaez Baena, maybe. But in the end, zero out of three. But yeah, I guess for Roberto Carbaez Baena, obviously, it was still a very important week to, uh, to get this done. Is there something about the Marrakesh courts for him, you know, that's that makes it so special? Or is it more just... I don't know. First week of the play, he's really good on it. That the field is usually like you know, just let's say average quality compared to most events. And by the way, this is his third Challenger final, uh, Challenger ATP Tour final. Both of them he won before 2018. Yeah, let's say that he's not going to 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 chase the record of uh, Humbert's record of finals won <laughs> because he lost the he lost right. for the first time his third, third final. Uh, but yeah, I mean, very good to be back in the final for him. I guess his ranking will be happy uh, about that. But also winning winning matches, you know, starting the clay season well, it's of course, you know, a big deal for him. And I would say that he can be also quite satisfied with the final also. You know, first set was really close. If he, if he manages to win it, Somehow, you know, could have could have been in a tiebreak, but in the end against Berrettini, you know, it, it can happen. In the end, this week he proved to be uh, at a very high level, and so yes, yeah, still some ups and downs for Matteo, but I would say that for Carbayas, it's uh, still a very good week. Overall, Marrakesh has been a fi fine event. Mm, I would say that there have been also some, you know, some few good matches here and there throughout the week. Uh, so yeah, but. I mean, overall, the, let's say also the results I was more or less expecting. Even the players who got a run were the like, you know, the players I was kind of of watching because Carbayes having won the title last year, you know, you can you can guess also that he can he can do well this year too. Navone is a player who's doing very well lately overall. So, you know. I don't I don't know don't even feel like we got that many surprises there. Yeah, I think Kotov also made the semis last year, didn't yeah, he? Or maybe it was quarters. Semis, yeah. yeah, semis lost to Miller last year. So it's also back to back for him. 
Uh, Navona, I think, it was actually a bit of a bigger story because, uh, well, after Rio, he missed like what a, a month and a half. So it was his first event since Rio. In Rio, I feel like even though he made the finals, he wasn't actually playing as well as he sometimes was on the Challenger Tour. <laughs> and uh, but so, so it was still kind of kind of nice for me to just see him have a solid run here. Maybe yeah. nothing sort of outrageous, but he did beat Stan Wawrinka. He did beat Vukic, who was also like kind of rounding into form. And then, of course, against Berrettini, he also took the first set. Yeah, I think with that, we can pretty much um, stop talking about Marrakesh and just head to Houston, which was the kind of the um, weird one out there, out of all these three events, of course, being in the States, but also being on that synthetic uh, version of clay, hard true, which is basically a green clay, but this one is actually colored red. It does play into the results quite a lot. Uh, ben Shelton went 2-7 and seven on clay last year, this time going for a completely different idea. So he's not playing Monte Carlo, he's not playing Estoril, he goes to Houston. And I suppose in the next few years, we'll probably be seeing him in Houston more. Uh, it will depend, in my opinion. You know, if he gets even higher in the ranking, would you like to miss, for example, Monte Carlo as a top eight seed? I don't know. Probably not. Uh, probably not. Yeah, true. You know, more or less like Fritz uh, is is trying to do it now that he, you know, he's already out of Monte Carlo this year. But he actually oh, he actually, also... he actually gets very good results in Monte Carlo. Yes, exactly, exactly. Quarter final and then semi final last year, um, where he could have actually did even better in that match. But anyway, um, yeah. So I um, about Shelton. Well, what to say? Uh, yeah, he went to seven on clay last year, but I also would say that this year, mm, you know, mm, 12 months have passed and he, he you know, he seems a, a different player in terms of the results. You know, he there there were the, that bad stretch b between the Australian Open and let's say more or less the, the US Open where he, he, he had not get, you know, back-to-back -back wins on the tour and he, he was also struggling. But I feel like, uh, it's been very good. I was liking his choice last year to try to play as much as he could on clay and on grass also, you know, um, in conditions in, also in Europe where he, he hadn't played before. So I think that all this experience that he got may actually help him very much. And this week he 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 played well, a lot of also uh, close matches, but we we have been known about him that he is a player that he's able to find solutions, uh, just stick with his game, his plan, and, you know, just fight. He's a very, very big fighter. Even this week he proved it. And yeah, I would say that it's it's pretty pretty good story because second career title, the first on on clay, and let's say I, it's it's still a player. I I don't consider him one of the main favorites for the clay events, you know, the big clay events this year. But it's still that kind of player that you know, would you really want to meet him? Well, I don't know because he he has um, all these you know these things in his game that makes him really uncomfortable to 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 face so i if i am a top player i would prefer to avoid him even if it's clay and maybe he's not going to be you know that uh, big of a factor maybe in the big tournament as it can be he can be on hard or i don't know yeah um i don't think he's a horrible clay player at all obviously houston is not really an event that uh, has much to do with the european red clay but still um i think that that two, even that two seven record last year was like a little bit misleading he was playing a lot better mm. than that for the most part and uh, two seven by the way is uh atp tour only uh he obviously won two more ma two matches as well in the Cagliari yeah, yeah. challenger mm. uh with uh, which it would be a little better for eight i think but yeah, uh, here he actually didn't have a top 50 win on clay before. Here he beats Echeverri and Tiafo. You mentioned that sort of like, you know, gritting it out on the clay last year, like just playing through his uh, lack of experience on the surface, trying to learn. That's something that also really connects him to Nakashima a couple of years back. Here they played mm -hmm. in the quarters. So that was a bit of a funny one for me, just sort of thinking about how... You know, they both really put a lot of effort into getting better on clay. And I think they both did. With Shelton, we haven't maybe yet seen it because, of course, this is a different type of clay. But uh, probably we will. With Nakashima, of course, we have already sort of um, seen that many, many times. 
and yeah, I mean, I don't think it's a big surprise at all. I mean, I'm I'm a little surprised that there's a, a title, uh, Shelton Hurkacz surprise for our show, because uh, if Hurkacz, Hurkacz, yeah, maybe, but like Shelton was always going to be one of the main favorites in Houston. Uh, maybe yeah. you know, I don't know if the main one. I don't think the tournament had like a proper main favorite, even that. France yeah, but it was it was a chance because even you know considering mm, you know. Probably, let's say, uh, Echeverry in in good, very good state could have been, maybe, um, you know, could have even done a bit better than 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 that. But in the end, he he still had a good week. I mean, Shelton is a player of great qualities. So yeah, especially in Houston, the the American clay, I was liking his chances. Probably, let's say that also Tiafo is kind of a story because you know yeah. his season. Mm, hasn't started in in a good way at all, and you know he 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 fell short in in Houston, but being able to be back in the final and actually play a, a competitive match against Shelton also in the final, so I would say that it's a very very much needed week for him overall, even if he didn't you know win the title. Why is he jumping into the pool in his socks? Is actually what I'm wondering <laughs> about. Yeah, uh, but. Fair, okay. Maybe he just doesn't like to show his feet to uh, people around him. That's okay. I don't mind that at all. But yeah, I agree. Tiafo was was definitely a story given how he started the season. I think he was seven and seven for the year uh, coming into Houston. So like most tournaments, he was still getting one win each. But it's not really what Francis wants to do, right? It's not something yeah. that fulfills his ambition. And uh, yeah, just making the final here again, obviously a nice achievement, but he wasn't able to quite follow it up and defend his title. Also, I have to say about Shelton, I forgot that um, when it comes to that, uh, what, what you said sort of about him not maybe having that very poor patch that he had last year, he's really consistent this year. Uh, he hasn't had the highlights yet of 2023, but this is this is kind of progress to me. But anyway, yeah. um, let's, uh, let's maybe leave leave it at that how much time do we have anything else from houston that we should chat about there was also of course thomas martin very for a while we are going at that rematch from last year he makes the semis here i think also a perfectly serviceable result really like yeah uh, i, I would say that even add. here you know we hadn't really mm -hmm. have that many surprises because shelton tiafo Echeverri, you know mm, yeah that that he played well this week um, but overall, you know, mm, he, considering his current, you know, mm, state, how he's doing right now, it also for him, it's, you know, mm, can feel right, you know, that he is in the semi final in Houston. So uh, I would say that there, there hasn't been anything that really, you know, left me speechless or something like that. It's, it's been. I would say good week. I, I don't always every season, you know, focus so much on Houston, I have to admit, because uh, since tennis goes back to, you know, my time uh, in Marrakesh, in Nestoril, and there are already two, two, two tournaments, and then there is the, the challenger close to me in, in the same week. So usually Houston is a tournament I don't really get to follow, but this week I've been able to follow it uh, a bit more and yeah, it plays it plays well. I would say a lot of people criticize the clay <laughs> in Houston, but I'm totally fine with it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, leads it leads into the a challenger green clay swing. I think it's fine as a one-off on the on the tour. Why not? Uh, just a very unique event when it comes to the ATP Tour scope, but it's actually connected to the, all the challengers on green clay. I think it makes sense. There's an interesting question here from Sean, who says, which American will be Shelton's toughest matchup? Just American. Um, Tommy Paul? Yeah, I would I would say yes, because I imagine, you know, Tommy Paul is probably the, the best among them in, you know, taking the time a little bit away from you, playing a bit quicker, and, you know, also maybe Shelton, if he... If he maybe needs a bit more time with the back and is going to be more difficult. Mm, so yeah, probably I would say Tommy, me too. <laughs> nice shout as well from Matthew who says that Jensen Brooksby, whenever ah, he comes yeah, back. I mean... That's interesting. Uh, 
I feel like it could be a bit of a, you know, Shelton comes out, destroys him matchup sometimes, but also could be one where like Brooksby suddenly manages to trick mm-hmm. him and just sort of, I don't know, make it a Marcos Giron Tokyo semifinal, right? Because Marcos Giron actually went through my head, but I don't think that would be every single Shelton Giron match. I think that was a bit of a one off. But yeah, Tommy Paul just seems like pretty much like the, the toughest one stylistically. And uh, he's been kind of tough for Ben, I guess. I mean, I think it's too old between them. Of course, losing this year already in uh, Dallas yes, yeah. to him. And a pretty brutal exit at that too. Uh, but beating him in some very important matches as well. US Open last year, for example. And I think also Tokyo, right? Um, yeah, and I think we might just dedicate the last 10 minutes to Monte Carlo since this mm-hmm. is kind of a different... Um, moment for us sort of when it comes to the the show because usually we do it just sort of like ahead of the week now we've already had two days yeah. of play obviously it's not the the biggest sort of um you know a dose of tennis that you could get from monte carlo because we still haven't seen any top eight seeds but we actually know quite a lot about how the draw will be shaping up uh, we've got uh, obviously all the top players, really Djokovic, Sinner, Alcaraz, Medvedev is the top four seeds. Some very dangerous contenders like the defending champion Andrei Rublev, Holger Rune, the finalist from last year. Maybe Kasper Ruth, maybe Hubert Hurkacz, maybe Grigor Dimitrov. Uh, Stefan Tsitsipas has won it, has won this event twice. Maybe Zverev. So yeah, let's maybe just um, chat about sort of what are your what are your feelings about the top seeds and like. Who's sort of the main favorite to win this? Because I feel like we still have a lot of question marks regarding Yannick. Recently, they popped up about Alcaraz as well, about some arm issue. Personally, I just want to see him play. Like, I'm going to leave any uh, sort of thoughts about regarding that uh, until I see him on the court mm. because there's been a lot of, you know, information sort of coming in. No, he's yeah, good to play. As always. actually in trouble, yeah. And Djokovic, of course, as well, has like a big question mark on the, uh, over his head. Yeah, I feel a lot of pressure because last year I got the luckiest prediction of all time, probably. No, I'm, I'm kidding, you know, wasn't that lucky. But I, I was feeling that Rublev would have won it and I made it in the bracket. And, you know, I didn't do the bracket, so I will just, uh, this year, I mean, so I will just try to think. I will be very surprised, honestly, if Rublev, you know, does it again, honestly. Um, yeah, last year there has also been some some circumstances, but he was in a better place maybe than, than this year also. I mean, on clay in Monte Carlo, he, he always plays there, uh, plays well, I mean. Mm, but yeah, I'm not expecting him to defend the title. It's very difficult, you know, um, because... Yeah, I feel Sinner should be able to to do a solid solid performance. Will be, it be enough to win the title even here in Monte Carlo? We don't know. I mean, we we have to to see a bit. The thing is that we haven't seen them also play on the clay before uh, Monte Carlo, so it's even more difficult because it's not only the question mark about how they are going to play on Monte Carlo, but you know the la- the the last picture we 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 got from them is Miami. Uh, for Djokovic, even you know Indian Wells, even if it's not mm, uh, a great picture, Monte Carlo never really plays out really well for him. I don't know. I feel like if if fit, probably Alcaraz should be the favorite. We have a lot of contrasting information about him. I don't know. I will. I will probably go. You know. Uh, without having seen anything, probably I will not bet my house, of course, but I will put a penny on Alcaraz if he's fine. Yeah, as I've said a few times on this um, on these streams already, I think for me, Carlos is still like the number one player going into the clay. Whether that holds up by the time we're at Ron Garros, I don't know. And whether he's healthy or not, I also don't know. So sort of responding to Brenda's question, we just have no idea because as Mario said, there's a lot of contradicting information. Some people say that, you know, he barely, he only played forehand slices. And then there's a Spanish journalist saying, no, he's 100% good to go. Basically, we have no idea. However, uh, yeah, Roman Safurin, can he be a problem for Novak Djokovic? Maybe. I mean, he's had some awesome wins in the past, maybe not necessarily on clay. 
I would say that I kind of still expect a Novak win, but after that, Fils or Musetti, especially Musetti who beat him in Monte Carlo last year, injured or not. If it happens again, it will be injured kind of or hilarious. Not. But that's possible. Like, like yeah, isn't no, that yeah, really yeah, possible? Yeah, yeah. Like at this stage, if, if Djokovic and Musetti were to play tomorrow, yeah, I wouldn't absolutely. even say Novak is a big favorite. After he beats Safiulin here, maybe, yeah, maybe I'm going to see that, okay, so Novak is actually back. Sure. But like if that was the second round, Djokovic Musetti, I wouldn't even say that yeah, he was yeah, yeah, a big yeah, favorite. Yeah, but um, yeah, we'll see what happens sort of by the time they play. There's a Holger Rune mention, and I really like that. I think Holger could obviously use a big run. Last year, we had this brilliant, brilliant match between Rune and Sinner, probably one of the best wins of Holger in 2023. But now he's going to potentially have to face, well, first of all, Grigor Dimitrov in the third round, or maybe Matteo Berrettini. But then seen her in the quarterfinals. I would love to say that this is going to be as good a match as it was in 2023 if they play Rune Sinner. Uh, it's just been a long time since we saw Rune, even on clay, who was like going to compete against Yannick. The, their career trajectories have obviously gone in very different ways in the past 12 months. I hope that it's going to be as good a classic, and I, I hope that they're going to play. Yeah, of course, it will be very interesting. I'm not that optimistic this time. Uh, I still kind of think like he's in a bit of a process. And, you know, I, I like his chances of on clay usually. But probably this can be a season where he does, you know, I mean, was Rome finalist last year. Maybe as things progress, I don't know if he will be ready to... Um, to, to beat Yannick, but it will depend on also on Yannick's level, you know, a lot of times. It can be. It will be interesting, that's for sure. I will be here for it if it happens, because it, it will give us a lot of indications, especially, you know, from Rune's side, given that, you know, he hasn't got that many big runs lately. Absolutely. And um, something that I have to talk about, actually, this player, for the last six months, has been pretty irrelevant. But is is this period about to end? Is this going to be Stefanos Tsitsipas' week? He already advanced through the first round. He uh, beat Laszlo Jere via retirement. I didn't watch the match. It was while I was traveling. No, me but neither. He's going to play Jari or Echeverri in the second round. Jari was actually a rival for him last year in Monte Carlo. And then in the third round already, he can play Zvere for Ofner. Tsitsipas has fallen in the rankings, obviously. He's number 12. So... To even get the semis, he might have to go through both Zverev and Medvedev, for example, if Medvedev goes that far and Zverev goes that far. But um, why Tsitsipas is a big is a big story here. Obviously, he is a two-time champion of the event. Mm -hmm. Maybe it wasn't last year, but if he sort of has a chance of rebuilding soon, it has to be with a huge clay swing because his clay swing yeah, last absolutely. year, even though maybe it didn't you know contain a big title, it was still very very good. So are we going to get this from Stefanos Tsitsipas this week? What is your feeling regarding the, the Greek and his chances this week? Mm, I, I feel like he will have uh, a good clay season. He should, you know, it's his most favorable part of the year. So at least, you know, even when he is a bit low on confidence, usually he's able on clay to, uh, to have solid results. I would say would be really worrying for him if he if he you know doesn't doesn't get any good result on this clay season because uh, you know uh, we we are expecting him at least sooner or later you know to get at least a run or something. Monte Carlo is usually a good week for him. You know the titles got 2021, 2022. We are seeing here last year got a quarter final, but actually last year in Monte Carlo he was also. Um, you know, I know last year was coming back, but then he got good results on the clay, even without, you know, getting big titles. I'm expecting something. Let's say that I I want to put this pressure on him because I feel like uh, this is the period where he, if he wants to, uh, to show that he's present and that he wants to, to be back being, uh, mm, let's say, a big factor, 
at the you know in men's tennis landscapes he has to start on the clay in my opinion and then maybe he can carry also this confidence into the the next patch of the season and something like that but he needs to start here so um, yeah i will also be be very interested if it happens if he gets to to face for example someone like zverev medvedev you know will be very interesting to see how they uh, they match up this week here in Monte Carlo let's see but i'm expecting some answers from Tsitsipas yeah yeah um just to sort of uh, tell you guys what sort of pressure is on him besides the ranking like 2017 was the last time he played some challengers on clay so i'm talking like main tour only from 2018 i think his worst season on clay is 15 wins six losses and he's had some you know like 2021 he goes 23 and 5 the last two seasons, he goes 17 and 5, 17 and 4, 9 3, 15 5. I mean, yeah, just every single season, this is kind of like yeah. the one constant in his career that he's always going to be good on clay courts. Obviously, there's a lot of explanation for it regarding the um, game that he has, regarding the one handed back and weaknesses that on clay are very much easier to just cover up. Uh, there's a lot more time. There's a let's say even a pretty let's say more comfortable bounce for someone like him even despite the fact that one handers usually struggle on clay with like you know the whenever someone goes like really high top spin into their shot and also the fact that uh Cici pass like you know second serve return he stands so far back he basically hits every mm -hmm. single return of yeah. his forehand on the second serve there's a lot that sort of supports that stefano Cici pass will revive himself on clay theory but uh as of now, yeah, I agree, it's kind of unknown. Even a loss like, you know, to Zverev here in the third round, that's already poor for Stefanos, I would say, because he really needs yeah, this too. play season to be I think huge. The same. So um, the and pressure course, is on. It also depends, on. but yeah, I know that what they are, uh, you know, saying on the chat, but mm, my feeling is that he... I'm not saying that he has to win a Masters on clay this year, but if I imagine him, him, you know, not being in the semi-final at Monte Carlo, not being the semi-final in Madrid, not being the semi-final in Rome, and then it would be a bit disappointing considering, you know, his, you know, his story on the clay. So I would say that it is a moment for him to try to. Um, to get better and to try also to to save his ranking and to uh, to try to to get back some some you know good feelings because also some of his losses lately have also come in a bad way not only the loss in itself in itself but you know also the the way the match developed uh, both in Young Wells and Miami was pretty was pretty bad that's an interesting point Sean but I think in a way that only adds to the pressure that they're feeling because it's not like these guys have fulfilled their sort of career expectations. Yeah, exactly. These guys actually haven't done it. These guys haven't won the slams. So it's actually like there's more pressure even because like, how are they going to do it at the moment? Uh, but of course, that's a topic for kind of another day maybe as well. We don't have that much time anyway. So I think that's that probably concludes the talk on Monte Carlo tomorrow. A lot of round one matches still. The, the you know we're going to be finishing that round, but also a few second round clashes already. Zverev is going to start the action against Ofner, Djokovic against Safurin, of course. Fils Musetti probably one of the most watchable matches yeah. tomorrow as well. But still plenty of round one uh, clashes that are exciting too. Someone mentioned, I think it was maybe Matthew, probably because he always, yeah. I, I figured if someone mentioned Draper, it was going to be Matthew. Not that I, uh, I wouldn't mention Draper usually, but Matthew definitely um, wants to talk about him uh, quite a lot. Seems to be a, a bit of a fan. And Draper is going to play Hurkac in the first round, which is an exciting clash. They also faced off in Monte Carlo last year, second round, and was super close. Alex de Minor against Stan Wawrinka. So definitely lots to look forward to. Uh, I feel like we've pretty much covered it all and uh, we are running out of time anyway. So I guess, um, thank you, Mario. We Yeah, uh, thank you. And thank you for the whole year as well, because apparently <laughs> it's the no, anniversary. No, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure as always. Um, same. And uh, yeah, thank you guys for uh, being in the chat as well. Thank you for the questions and all, the, all your points. Uh, it's a pleasure being there, uh, being here with both Mario and also with, with you guys. 
So I think uh, that's is that is a good way to end this anniversary show. And also, oh by the way, WT Weekly is coming as well. Yeah, uh, it's like what thirty minutes, something like that. I think like 30 minutes. Yeah. Anyway, it's going to be very soon with uh, Nick and Jack, if I remember correctly. So make sure to tune into that. Uh, thank you. And we'll see you guys around. Yeah. Bye bye. <laughs>